For the first time during a pandemic, most Americans carry a potential superpower. In addition to a smartphone's many purposes, the very latest could become a personal biolab. As pressure mounts for states to reopen, technology will soon tell us who's at risk of catching COVID-19. In Connecticut, a police department tested a drone designed to monitor people's temperatures, heart and respiratory rates. It can also detect sneezing and coughing in a crowd, but the department dropped the program due to privacy concerns. Meanwhile, Facebook offering an opt-in symptom survey, asking users to report if they have a fever, cough, or shortness of breath. The social media giant then mapping responses from millions of Americans. This as Apple and Google develop a system to measure your risk by tracing your contacts. With these apps, as your phone's Bluetooth comes into contact with other phones, they share strings of numbers. If you then test positive for COVID-19, your phone can alert those phones. The companies maintain your identifying information will be protected. It's an amazing thing, but a lot of people have some very big constitutional problems with it. The White House Coronavirus Task Force is considering the implications. During crises like after 9-11, Americans often prefer protection over civil liberty. But experts warn it's a slippery slope. COVID-19 is very scary and issues of privacy and things are easy to fall by the wayside and very hard to recover once they're compromised. As companies reopen their doors, People may feel pressure to use this new technology to maintain their livelihoods. There could be employers who say you can't come to work unless you show your app or grocery stores who do the same thing. Or maybe you can't get benefits un like uh, the unemployment benefits unless you can prove you have that app. Testifying before senators this month, law professor Ryan Callow said a foreign operative who wished to sow chaos, an unscrupulous political operative who wished to dampen political participation, or a desperate business owner who sought to shut down the competition, all could use self-reported instances of COVID-19 to achieve their goals. The problem here is we don't have a federal privacy law, so this all has to come from written agreements with tech companies, with application developers, with governments. What we'd much rather see is this: these principles enshrined in law. Laws, she says, with guarantees, only necessary data is collected that's used for a specific purpose and then deleted. And since technology usually moves much faster than government, Chang suggests lawmakers stick to the basics. So what we need to start from are our principles, which hopefully haven't changed, that we value individuals, we value privacy, we value rights, we have rights of appeal and things like that. Chang says for lawmakers, there is a delicate balance between keeping people safe and allowing them to be free. Jennifer Wish on CBN News, Woodstock, Virginia. Well, it's getting scary out there. And, and when you start thinking that there'll be government drones hovering overhead, oh, mercy. Uh, monitoring your fever. Um, but here's the deal. The, they're now asymptomatic carriers of the virus. And so all of these technologies are of no, no use at all if you can't identify that someone's a carrier. Uh, so it's we're, we're back to basics. How can we have rapid tests? And by rapid tests, you can get a result within 15 minutes. And so regardless of you, are you evidencing any symptoms at all? Can you be tested? And then contact tracing. Who have you had contact with? Uh, if there's no symptoms, this gets really hard. And that's this is the major difference between COVID and SARS. With SARS, if you had it, you were very ill, not just a little bit ill, you were very ill. And so it was very easy then to do the contact tracing and to get you hospitalized. Uh, but with this one, we don't know. And then the latest news, well, you can get it and then recover and then get it again, just like the common cold. Uh, so I have no idea. <laughs> Look well, at you these jo things. You joined you know, a large group you know, of scientists. I, I, I have nervous <laughs> laughter because I have no idea. Yeah. How, how are we going to get through this? Just when you think there's an answer, it gets shot out of the water. Well, speaking of technology, mental health issues among adolescents and young adults are skyrocketing. A leading researcher thinks that cell phones are a part of the problem. Heather Sells shows us what parents can do to help their kids, especially during this pandemic, when they're even more likely to be tied to those devices. 
Several years ago, we began seeing the number of young Americans with certain mental health disorders jump. This trend of teens and young adults experiencing depression, suicidal thoughts and psychological distress stumped researchers. The economy was doing very well, so that really didn't seem to line up. Um, so I puzzled over this for a really long time. Then Dr. Jean Twenge came across this Pew study and discovered that 2012 became the year that most Americans owned a smartphone. That was when smartphones became common. It's also right around the time that social media went from being optional to mandatory among teens. She has since dubbed this post-millennial generation iGen. iGen was the first generation to spend their entire adolescence with smartphones. And that has impacted how much time they spend with their friends face to face. It's impacted um, their independence and it looks to be impacting their mental health and happiness as well. Twenge and other researchers study data on 200,000 kids ages 12 to 17. They found disorders like major depression up by more than 50 percent. The numbers were worse for teenage girls who said they simply felt left out. Their depression rates soared and so did their suicide rates. I mean, they're agreeing with items like my life isn't useful. I don't enjoy life. Um, I'm feeling sad or hopeless. One of the problems noted by experts, social media is designed to hook us and keep us coming back, often for hours at a time. Author Caleb Kinchlow says teens are especially vulnerable. There's this idea that if I'm not always connected, that I might be missing out on something. Now, the thing about it is they don't know exactly what it is, but they just know they're missing out on something. In addition to mental health concerns, this iGen doesn't get much actual face time with friends. They're less likely to go out socially, have a driver's license or a paid job. And that's especially true right now as people practice social distancing. Add it all up and you have a generation that has missed key social cues. Always communicating via a text or through a screen you miss the interpersonal nuances that are imperative to communicating with other people. Something I hear from managers a lot, they'll, they'll say, you know, I like, I like iGen, but I'm surprised at how many will not look me in the eye. And they don't have the social skills that we need them to have for the jobs we're hiring for. Well, researchers agree mental health problems are up, not all buy into Twenge's conclusions about smartphones, but most agree on some practical measures that can make a difference, a big one, the importance of sleep in keeping mental health problems at bay. That means kids and adults should literally power down well before bedtime. And don't bring the phone to bed because that bright blue light can trick brains into thinking it's still daytime. Also, limit daily use. Most of the research points toward mental health and happiness being the best at around an hour or two of use a day. You get beyond two hours, especially beyond three and four hours a day of use of electronic devices during leisure time, that's when the issues start to show up. If adults can begin to model this good behavior for their kids, especially right now as families are spending even more time together, that could mean better health for all of us. Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, I don't know if it'll mean better health or not. We're getting to know each other a whole lot more. Yeah. Uh, but I am communicating more, more with my children via Zoom. How well, about you? Well, your kids are all out of town. Yeah, so they're all in other you know, cities. So. That becomes a blessing in those circumstances. But Well, it becomes a source of worry, too. Yeah. I mean, well. Um, you know, are they safe? Is you know, is that there a viral outbreak and all thing. that? <laughs> so we have these Zoom calls. Yeah, I, I think it's very easy to feel like in the midst of what seems like everything has stopped, that I can go to my phone and then things seem to gear up again. I'm really trying to break away from that sense that somehow it connects me to something I need to do. Well, I find it good to, uh, to take a device fast uh, yeah, and just I, set seriously. aside time where, where you don't. I also find it good to use the screen settings particularly at night, so you're not getting that blue blue light. Uh -huh. All of my kids have the special glasses, so regardless but Is of, yours rose-colored or what? My, I, don't, I can't, I can't, I have to use reading glasses to see the screen, which is just how decrepit I am. 
Uh, but you, you change the settings and, and suddenly it's not producing that blue light that triggers you to stay awake and stay anxious. Yeah, I have some funny little yellow glasses that kind of... But I, I don't think we're getting rid of the devices. I don't, I don't think either, that's happening. Uh, and I think particularly in COVID-19, the devices are giving us an, at least an illusion of connectedness. We can at least see people and get updated. Also an illusion of control. <laughs> well, I've, <laughs> I've given up on that a long time. Long gone. Yeah. <laughs> control is always an illusion. Exactly. Hello, I'm Gordon Robertson. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more encouraging videos like this one. Welcome to the 700 Club Interactive Family, and God bless you.